Time is in here.
Okay, that was the show-off piece. <laughs> and there's a big one at the end. Uh, welcome to my final Reformation concert and hog roast. The hogs have been sainted and properly cooked. Uh, I've got everything on. I'll, I'll, I won't get to hear. I never get to hear these because I'll be working on the beans. Uh, but we have Reverend Kilps and Reverend Bender. He'll be doing Luther. He'll be doing the mind of Cleavy. Uh, so we pray for him. Uh, is there anything else I need? You guys are ready to go. Now, there was a tradition that was broke. Broken? Broken. Broked. Broke. It, it has been broken. Uh, because they actually, the choir practiced. We never did that. This is after 20 some years. Uh, anyhow, uh, we thank them for being here. And if you, uh, you'll note in the, in the uh, program, there's parts for pastors. And looking out there, I don't think we have enough pastors to be a choir by themselves. So if the men would just sing those uh, parts, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Otherwise, it's going to be really quiet and uh, boring. So join in on those. I think everything else, these guys are not responsible for any of the bad words in here. Uh, also, uh, and it starts out in the first section, Luther was known for his uh, insults. And I, I did find in putting this together, he really had an issue with flatulence. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's one of the main characters in this, uh, is flatulence. And uh, so uh, enjoy. And uh, when we are done, I'll uh, hopefully reappear, and we'll have a prayer, and then we can head up. Now, there is one other goal for this year, and that is no leftovers. Everything goes out the door, which means you're going to be taking stuff home, and don't be shy uh, because we don't want it. Because it'll be, all we do is put it in the refrigerator till it rots. So, so take it home, and there should be enough, I think, hope, pray, of everything. So... Uh, with that, I will turn it over to, I think he starts, right? Okay, have fun. Welcome to Pastor Cleavy's final Reformation concert and hog roast. The views expressed in this program are those of Cleavy and Luther and do not necessarily reflect the views of those leading the program. <laughs> Over the past 27 years, we have eaten in excess of 60 hogs, which is pretty amazing considering the meal is not the point of the evening. We've used the hog roast and concerts as an excuse to bring Luther's wisdom and application to a variety of topics, from education to parenting, from separation of church and state to the office of the holy ministry, the catechism, law and gospel, and beyond. Today, a disclaimer must be made. We will be hearing some truly cringeworthy statements made by Luther, the great reformer. We live in a time when such colorful language would get you canceled. Cancel culture says we must avoid anything that could be interpreted as questioning someone else's beliefs, and worse, mocking them. The problem is, if we say things in a way that no one is offended, we have probably said nothing of real importance. Speaking the truth is important and, by definition, exclusive. It may even be confrontational. If we value how people feel about what we are saying more than what we are saying, won't, be, won't we be devaluing the truth, especially when it comes to the truth of God's word? Much of what offends us in Luther's writings is, frankly, Luther speaking truth. And just as we are uncomfortable with some of his language today, so it was at Luther's time as well. When there was talk about Philip Melanchthon, <coughs> Luther's friend and colleague in the Reformation, it was noted that Melanchthon employed the greatest moderation in negotiations 
pertaining to the gospel. Dr. Luther said, The little fellow is a godly man, and even if he should do wrong, his intention's not bad, but it's because he's taken captive by others. He hasn't accomplished much by his method, and he used bad judgment in dedicating his books. I think that when I reflect on the matter, that my way is still the best. I speak right out and scold my opponents like schoolboys, for a naughty stump requires a tough veg. When Luther mentioned Melanchthon's bad judgment in dedicating his books, he was referring to the practice of putting flattering dedications in his books, even of those who oppose the Reformation. Luther defends his own use of strong language for two reasons. First, because moderation simply is not productive, and second, those to whom he is speaking are intended, indeed, like a knotty stump. They simply do not give in easily to reason, logic, or scripture, and their resistance must be overcome by forceful argument. Our first hymn, Isaiah Mighty Seer, in days of old, was first published in Luther's Deutsche Messe in 1526. It was published in the Lutheran hymnal with the tune Luther composed, which has become inseparably connected with this hymn. After Luther had taken a tour of the congregations that left the Roman Church to become churches of the Reformation, he was driven to produce the small catechism and the teacher's edition, the large catechism. In his introduction, he holds the pastors of these churches accountable for not teaching the basics of the Christian faith to those in their stewardship and care. You shameful gluttons and servants of your bellies are better suited to be swineherds and keepers of dogs. It is not for trivial reasons that we constantly treat the catechism and exhort and implore others to do the same. For we see that unfortunately many preachers and pastors are very diligent in doing so and thus despise both their office and this teaching. Some do it out of their great learnedness, while others do it out of pure laziness and concern for their bellies. They approach the task as if they were pastors and preachers for their stomach's sake, and had nothing to do but to live off the fat of the land 
as they were used to doing under the papacy. Everything is that they are to teach and preach is now very clearly and easily presented in so many salutary books, which truly deliver what the other manuals promised in their titles, sermons that preach themselves, sleep soundly, be prepared, the Saris, yet they are not upright and honest enough to buy such books, or if they already have them, to consult or read them. All these shameful gluttons and servants of their bellies are better suited to being Schweinhorn und Hundhartlen than guardians of their souls and pastors. Martin Luther prepared the hymn, O Lord, Look Down from Heaven Behold, late in the year 1523, as a musical setting of Psalm 12. It was included in the first Lutheran hymnal in 1524. The present tune appeared with this text later that same year in the Erfurt in Caridian and has been associated with it ever since. Like many of Luther's hymns, it is a good example of hymnody being used to educate the church of fundamental biblical doctrine. Jacobus Latimus was a Flemish theologian whose primary focus was to oppose Luther and the Protestant Reformation. However, as far as the argument with Luther, it was doomed from the start. Luther's presuppositions, his confidence in the word as a final and sufficient authority for the proclamation of the church, combined with his lack of reverence for the accepted scholastic theologians, made him incomprehensible to most of his professorial colleagues. How could Latimus understand a statement like this? Thomas Aquinas wrote a great deal of heresy and is responsible for the rule of Aristotle, the destroyer of godly doctrine. What do I care that the bishop of bulls has canonized him? Of Latimus and his colleagues, Luther said, he, together with his sophists, 
has never recognized what grace and sin, law and gospel, Christ and man are. And he asserted that his arguments of, he op of the opponents were worthless, for he proves everything from human writings. Neither Gregory, whom Latimus had quoted, nor any angel has the right to set forth or teach in the church something which cannot be demonstrated from Scripture. The tone of Luther's reply to Latimus was disdainful and impatient. It showed that no real meeting of minds could be expected from further theological discussions with the scholastic professors. The reason, which had become ever more apparent, was that Luther and these opponents no longer spoke the same theological language. The feet are to be washed all through life, even in the case of those who are cleansed. Therefore Christ says, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Doesn't this text speak for me and against Latimus? All sins are washed away, yet something remains to be bathed. The meaning is clear. How could all be washed away unless they were pardoned and remitted through grace? How could cleansing still be necessary unless sin still remained? We shall come back to this later. At the moment, Latimus' confidence must be destroyed so that he may see that sometimes the fathers were but men and so come to recognize the fallacious way, I've called it begging the question, in which he argues. He ought first to have shown that to be clean all over means that no sin remains after baptism. Gregory's words do not demand this interpretation, or if they do, they must be denied. Our opponents, having injected their own view into the words of the fathers, rush forward as would an ass under the pelt of a lion. These deceitful workers manufacture principal articles of faith for us, not from the opinions of the fathers, but from their own, which they impose on what the fathers say. Describing someone as being like an ass that rushes forward as would an ass under the pelt of a lion is a phrase used by Luther several times in his writings. It is descriptive of someone who thinks too highly of themselves and their arguments. Thinking that they are great defenders of the truth, they are really just making asses of themselves by the stupidity of the argument. In contrast, Luther also had a pastorly and fatherly, more tender side. He wrote the hymn, From heaven above to earth I come, for his children, for the Christmas of 1534. It is still beloved today. Even though any pastor that chooses to have us sing all 15 verses will feel the displeasure of a marathon hymn, it is well worth it.
us all with gladsome cheer, go with the shepherds and draw near to see the precious gift of God who hath his own dear Son bestowed. Give heed my heart, lift up thine eyes, what is it in yon manger lies? Who is this child so young and fair? The blessed Christ child lieth there. Art thou how poor and small that thou dost choose thine infant bed where humble cattle lately I too must sing with joyful tongue that sweetest ancient cradle song. Glory to God in highest heaven, who unto us his Son hath given, while angels sing with pious mirth a glad new year to all the In his treatise against the heavenly prophets, Luther's replies to a former colleague, Andreas Karlstadt, who had disagreed with him and gone in a direction which threatened the doctrines of the Lutheran Reformation. In this treatise, Luther is not attacking Karlstadt, but rather is seeking to demonstrate just how subjective and unbiblical the positions of Karlstadt and those known as the spiritualists are. It was the attack of fidelity to the truth of God's word that led Luther to unload his sharp attack. While Luther was in hiding at Wartburg Castle, Karlstadt was instrumental in leading a movement to demolish everything that could be connected to the Roman church. Karlstadt sought to do away with all traditional forms, images, vestments, including the mass. This caused Luther to come out of hiding to preach against the destructive mob. In the treatise, Luther rails against a fictional character, Peter Rultz, but Karlstadt was his intended target. Fourthly, St. Paul writes in the same chapter, let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. But here comes Peter Roots again, blowing his own horn, posing as a Greek, and says that the word diakron means discerning. It also refers to a remembrance, meaning that we must, in spirit, sharply discern the body of Christ and imitate the suffering of Christ with calm desire and fervor and so weiter. Everything that the spirit teaches must be related to the spiritual remembrance of Christ. Roots knows no other tune. Woods that he knew it well and were not using it as a cloak to spread his poison. Dear Peter, I beg you, put your glasses on your nose or blow your nose a bit to make your head lighter and the brain clearer. Look a little closer with us on the text. Such is the trifling art with which these spiritual prophets busy themselves. They have discovered many similar interpretations in the Old Testament and daily find more. They teach about the sevenfold sprinkling and fill their books with this kind of skill as if it were such a priceless thing which nobody but themselves knew about. In general, their interpretation is so stupid that it makes one feel like vomiting especially their sevenfold sprinkling. They do not consider that such has to be proved from Scripture and that it means nothing unless it is clearly expressed elsewhere, as I have explained since the Sermon on the Ten Lepers. For them, however, it's enough just to have contrived it, thereby it is proved. In closing, I want to warn everyone truly and fraternally to be aware of Karlstadt and his prophets for two reasons. Esther, because they run about and teach without a call. This God condemns to Jeremiah who says, I did not send them and yet they ran. I did not speak to him and yet they prophesied. For this reason, they are judged by Christ as thieves and murderers who do not enter by the door but climb in by another way. They boast of possessing the spirit more, more than the apostles. And yet, far more than three years now, they have secretly prowled about and flung about their dung. Were he a true spirit, he would have once have come forward and given proof of his call by signs and words. But he is a treacherous, secret devil who sneaks around in corners until he has done his damage and spreads his poison. As Luther said, a knotty stump requires a tough wedge. The division Karlstadt brought to the church continues to this day. The Reformed, as they may be known today, continue to deplore the historic forms of Christian art and liturgy, which accounts for their use of auditoriums rather than sanctuaries, street clothes rather than vestments, stages rather than altars, and pyramids and secular forms of music drawn from the culture in which they reside.
are they? Uh, they're right here. So page 10? Yep. Thank you. At first, Luther took no part in the dispute between the Catholic Union and the Schmalkald League. But when Against the Elector of Saxony was published, in which Duke Henry referred to Elector John Frederick as one of whom Martin Luther has called his dear and reverent Hanswurst. Hanswurst means buffoon. Luther felt compelled to answer. He did so applying the term Hanswurst not to his elector, but to Henry, and thereby produced one of his most violent attacks upon the opponents of the Reformation. Hanswurst refers to a German carnival figure carrying a long leather sausage around his neck 
and wearing a colorful clown-like costume. He was a stock character in comedies of Luther's time. Warning, this Luther insult is a doozy. Since you and your Harry lie so shamelessly and take every opportunity to do so, your book is, for the most part, nothing but sheer lies from Anfang to Enden. It is just like our Lord saying, he who is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. How can he, who cannot keep himself from little unnecessary lies, keep himself from big ones? Indeed, since you and your Harry are such vulgar blockheads that you think such lewd and stupid oh. gossip will harm me and bring you honor, you are the real Hans Wursts, blockheads, boors, and dunderheads. And I would answer you with this, that you are both father and son, incorrigible, shameless, and perjuring scoundrels in saying that I have called my most gracious Lord Hans Wurst. Such Wurst tricks require no further answer. Some people probably suppose that you regard my gracious Lord as Hans Wurst because by God's, that is your enemies, by God's grace he is strong, plump, and somewhat round. But think what you will. So, make in your pants, hang it around your neck, then make a jelly of it and eat it like the vulgar sows and asses you are. That is an image that is hard to get out of your mind. <laughs> Moving on in two of his writings, Luther referred to a German hymn that enjoyed great popularity before the Reformation. Luther argued from the text of Let God Be Blessed that communion under both forms had been known and accepted even before the Reformation. Originally, this had been a Corpus Christi hymn. But in 1524, Luther discontinued the observance of Corpus Christi in Wittenberg, where the host was carried around the town. So it is unlikely that he transformed the medieval Corpus Christi hymn into a Lutheran post-communion chorale to save a liturgical song that was popular with the people and that he himself treasured. Bind us, may with this beast 
therefore be behind us. O Lord, have mercy. For thy kindness did so constrain thee that thy blood should bless and sustain me. All our debt thou hast paid, peace with God once more is made. O Lord, have mercy. May God bestow on us his grace and favor to please him with our behavior and live as brethren here in love and union now reap at this past communion O Lord have mercy let my good spirit forsake Grant that heavenly minded he may us give thy church, Lord, to see days of peace and unity. O Lord, have mercy. Luther's treatise against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil is the most bitter of Luther's polemic writings. It is intimately related to the political power struggle between the Pope and the Emperor. The struggle reached its climax when Charles V made many concessions to the German Protestant princes at the Diet of Spires in 1544 in order to gain their support for his war against Francis I of France and the Turks. The recess of June 10, 1544 guaranteed ecclesiastical revenues and suspension of lawsuits against Protestants already in progress at the Supreme Court and the abolition of recesses passed by previous diets against Protestants. Moreover, it announced plans for another German diet at which a Christian reformation by devout and peace-loving men would be discussed. The recess did not even mention the Pope or ecclesiastical authority. When the contents of the recess became known in Rome, Pope Paul III immediately summoned a council of cardinals and had a cautionary brief drawn up against the emperor. He charged Cardinal Giovanni Marone, who was at that time in Lyons, France, with its delivery to the imperial court. The brief, originally consisting of two drafts, the first was more radical than the second, was completed on August 24th. It accused the emperor of interference in the rights of the apostolic see, demanded the withdrawal of all concessions made to Protestants, and threatened in careful terminology, stern papal action if the emperor should refuse to comply. Finally, the assertion was made that the general council, rather than an imperial diet, should create a settlement of the religious issues dividing Germany, thus repeating the fundamental principle of medieval papalism that Rome is to be arbiter in temporal affairs and judge in religious affairs. To no one's surprise, Luther responded. Meanwhile, we see and hear what a master or conjurer the Pope is. He's like a magician who conjures golden into the mouths of silly people. But when they open their mouths, they have fetishizer in them. So is this shameful fop. Paul Zedritta calls for a council now for the fifth time so that anyone who hears the words must think he is serious. But before we can turn around, he has conjured horse dirt into our mouths for he wants to have a council over which he can exercise his power and whose decisions he could trample on. So the very devil himself would thank him for such a council, 
And no one but the miserable devil together with his mother, his sister, and his whoring children, Pope, Cardinals, and the rest of his devilish scum in Rome will get there. Luther often revisited music that was used in Christendom from ancient times. This is the case with the next hymn, Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord, where Luther improved the theology, especially of the third verse. Changes Luther made were always to remove the false or questionable doctrine that had crept in through the centuries, but always seeking to retain what was sound. He had in mind reform rather than replacing. In his treatise against the Roman papacy, Luther continues his response. He writes, in Pope Paul's briefs to the Emperor Charles, it says further, and you should know that it is not your prerogative to choose who shall be in the council, for that is the prerogative of our jurisdiction. Gently, dear Polly, dear donkey, don't dance around. Oh, dearest little ass pope, don't dance around. Dearest, dearest little donkey, don't do it. For the ice is very solidly frozen this year because there was no wind. You might fall and break a leg. If a fart should escape you while you were falling, the whole world would laugh at you and say, Ugh, the devil, how the ass pope has befouled himself. 
And that would be a great crime of less majesty against the Holy See in Rome, which no letters of indulgence or plenitude of power could forgive. Oh, that would be dangerous. So consider your own great danger beforehand, hellish father. Dear one, why shouldn't the emperor have authority to name at least several who should be in the council since the four principal councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon were not called by the popes, as there was no pope yet at that time, nor by bishops, but solely by the emperors Constantine, Theodosius I, Theodosius II, and Marcion, who assembled, called, and named the bishops to the council and themselves attended it. Yes, we afterward established in our decretals that only the Pope should convoke councils and name the participants. Luther is just getting started. But dear one, is this true? Who commanded you to establish this? Silence, you heretic. What comes out of your mouth must be kept. I hear it. Which mouth do you mean? The one from which the facts come? You can keep that yourself. Or is the one into which good Corsican wine flows? Let a hunchais into that. Oh, you abominable Luther. Should you talk to the Pope like this? Shame on you too, you blasphemous, desperate rogues and crude asses. And should you talk to an emperor or an empire like this? Yeah. You should malign and desecrate four such high councils with the four greatest Christian emperors just for the sake of your farts and decretals? Why do you let yourselves imagine that you are better than crass, crude, ignorant asses and fools who neither know nor wish to know what councils, bishops, churches, emperors, indeed what God and his word are? You are a crude ass, you ass pope, and an ass you will remain. It was not beyond Luther to put insult in hymns, as our next hymn text shows. In the first stanza, he puts, Restrain the murderous pope and Turk, who fain would tear from off thy throne. Many current hymnals avoid the insult, and the point by changing this into something like the Lutheran hymnal has, curb those who fain by craft and sword would wrest the kingdom from thy son. The point is still there, but Luther was a bit more direct. The medieval church had built an imposing system of doctrine on the Christian affirmation of the forgiveness of sins. 
whereas the gospel had spoken of a confession and absolution by members of the congregation, the Roman church connected the practice with its doctrine of the church. Out of monastic development came a system of penance, which carefully defined steps and helps for the priest. The priest would hear confession, but to test the sincerity of the penitent, would enjoin certain deeds as satisfaction before absolution could be proclaimed. The sacrament of baptism gave grace for original sin only. The sacrament of penance was directed toward mortal or actual sins. So the Christian who possessed the grace which the church dispensed through the sacraments would evidence such grace in contrition for sin, but would win added grace through confession and absolution, penance. The satisfaction imposed would win exemption from temporal punishment, whereas the priest's absolution forgave guilt and eternal punishment. In time, the practice afforded opportunity for abuses, such as payment of money as satisfaction. And the sale of indulgences, at least in the popular mind, was an easy way to escape punishment for sin. Here, and even hereafter. Truly, where the word of God is not found, the keys do not remain either. The keys want to be where God's word and the church are, or else there are no keys. Christ shared the keys with the Pope in a truly fine fashion. He, Christ, retains the true keys and leaves to the Pope the painted ones. The latter he may place in his escutcheon or hang on the wall. They have no place or space in the Church of Christ. But what do I think of Gregory's quotation mentioned above, which says, a ban is to be feared even if it is an unjust one? This is my answer. Whether the question is Gregory's or his mother's, it is nonetheless of the devil, and I would gladly come face to face with that doctor, and I would teach that I ought to fear injustice and lies, even if it were from an angel from heaven. I would take his horrible ban, and after having used it as toilet paper, wipe its nose. You do have to marvel at Luther's range of thought, from the heavenly to the depths of certain bodily function. The hymn, We All Believe in One True God, is definitely of the heavenly vein of Luther's mind. He took a medieval hymn that presented the Nicene Creed in a single stanza and rewrote it with three. These stanzas, devoted to the three persons of the Trinity, confess the work of creation and preservation, redemption and sanctification. Some of the basic emphasis found later in his catechisms are found here already. At the same time, he strengthened the musical structure of the hymn. Oh, we. 
we need, he doth provide us. He through snares and perils leadeth, watching that no harm betide us. He careth us, boy, and not hide. All things are governed by his Jesus Christ, His own Son, our Lord, possessing an equal God, hath throne and might, source of every grace and blessing. Born of Mary, Virgin Mother, by the power of the Spirit. A true man, our elder brother, that the lost might life inherit. Crucified for sinful man, and raised by God to life. Oh, 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 confess the Holy Ghost, whose sweet grace and comfort give and with the Father and the Son in eternal glory give who the church's own creation Keeps in unity of spirit, here forgiveness and salvation daily come through Jesus' merit. Where shall rise, and we shall be in bliss with God eternally. Amen. Luther's last sermon was delivered at Eisleben, his place of birth, on the 15th of February, 1546. Three days before his death, Luther said, we want to practice Christian love toward the Jews and pray that they convert, but also that they are our public enemies, and if they could kill, kill us all, they would gladly do so, and so often they do. Today it is stylish to call Luther an anti-Semite because of the harsh things he said and wrote regarding the Jews, but Luther had been one of the very few Christians who had reached out to the Jews with the gospel of Jesus Christ and was roundly rejected along with the gospel and the harshness of his words for them were really no different than the harsh words he had for Germans, Catholics, and anyone else who had rejected the truth of God's word and the gospel of Christ. Luther had then gone to Mansfeld to deal with issues related to his father's copper mine which had been passed down in the family. The negotiations were successfully concluded on the 17th of February, 1546. After 8 p.m. that evening, Luther experienced chest pains. When he went to bed, he prayed, into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God the common prayer of the dying. At 1 a.m. on the 18th of February, he awoke with more chest pain and was warmed with hot towels. He thanked God for revealing his son to him in whom he had believed. His companions, Justice, Jonas, and Michael Chalius shouted loudly, Reverend Father, 
Are you ready to die trusting in your Lord Jesus Christ and to confess the doctrine which you have taught in his name? A distinct yes, was Luther's reply. Death came to him at 2.45 a.m. He was 62. A piece of paper was later found in Luther's pocket. On it, he had written his last statement in Latin and German. It read, Wir sind Bettler, hoc est verum. We are beggars all, this is true. Luther's harsh words and fury that had been aimed at his opponents had also been unloaded on himself. If we walk away from Luther's insults, shaking our heads in disgust, we will miss the point. There is no other way of salvation but the person and works of Jesus Christ proclaimed in the Bible which Luther defended till his death. You may say, he should have been gentler with those who opposed him. He shouldn't have been such a potty mouth. He should have been more conciliatory like Melanchthon. If Luther had been, would he have been as successful? After all, we talk about Luther and not much about Melanchthon. Luther's own assessment was right. A knotty stump requires a tough wedge. Luther was that wedge. Please stand. Yeah.
be seated. Okay, it went on. It went on when I put it in my pocket. You can use this one if you want. No, that's okay. <laughs> so, you want so me to I, translate the mind of Cleavy? <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it for about 40 years. Yeah, it's. And I knew him in junior college. Good. In the olden days. Anyhow, we thank the uh, readers, the musicians. I'm sure it was wonderful. <laughs> you can listen to it on uh, Facebook, on our church account, and on YouTube. It will be up there sometime this evening. Uh, so it will theoretically be there. <laughs> We have, uh, we've timed, it was timed well for the food because I just got the last batch of beans out. Now, for you Germans that are here, al dente is the proper way of doing beans. They should have a little bit of crisp to them, not mush. <laughs> so, when you start hearing people say the beans aren't done, they're done. Hopefully, they're still warm. Uh, that, that time to tell. When you go upstairs, fill the seats at the, to the furthest end, because that's the closest to the beer. Uh, and, and all the food and all of that stuff. It's just easier if you, you kind of funnel yourself down that way. And especially, you'll, you'll see the first table you see, skip it. <laughs> go to the back. Um, other than that, there will be a, uh, Martin is up there, it's a box with a slot in the top. Uh, if any of you want to uh, assist with uh, the expenditures, thank you if you will. If you don't, who cares? Uh, it, it's all paid for already. So uh, now the other thing is we, God willing, are going to have leftovers. And if you're not used to this, do not be shy. because. Uh, when we're out, we're out. But I want to be out, OK? Uh, so make sure you take those things. And if you'd like to throw something in the box, thank you. If not, that's fine. Um, also, there are no committees. So there's nobody to clean up. And I'm assuming you're all going to eat. So if you would. If you want, have fun and help with the cleanup. At the end, I'll pull the, the cord, and uh, we will watch chaos turn into order as you figure out how to, <laughs> to clean up. Now, since we've been in this building, we lose a lot of people between upstairs and the kitchen. Uh, so the real party takes place in the kitchen. <laughs> so uh, if you are able, please stay and help with that cleanup. Now, there is one piece left by the composer Bux de Huda. <laughs> no, who, who's the composer? Pidor. Pidor? Vidor. Vidor. A vegan? <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, so after that, when it's done, you can go. Now we've got, we're going we're a little bit early, so You'll have time to potty and, and stuff like that before we sit down. But we cannot serve the food until everyone is at their seat. And if you haven't seen why, just do it. Because uh, you will see this whole crowd get, get plates in front of them in about five minutes once we start. So uh, by all means. So now the uh, last, uh, Ben, are you ready? OK. Here is the, I believe the quote is big ass organ piece. <laughs>
text message from President Willie. No. <laughs> I'm on restricted status. <laughs> Maybe it, I think maybe it held together better than I thought it would. Oh, yeah, I think it did. <laughs> Thank you. 